Hi, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce Beth Waters, who is the Manager of Professional Development for the ED at Brigham Women's Faulkner Hospital. She has over 35 years of ED experience in both adult and pediatric EDs. And she is currently the Training Center Coordinator and Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinator at Brigham Women's Faulkner Hospital. Beth is also a TNTC, BLS, and ACLS instructor. And her presentation today is called Heads Up, Pediatric Neuro in the ED. Take it away, Beth. Hi, welcome everyone. I know in this world of virtual um, technology, we are definitely a little bit handicapped, but I'm so glad that I'm able to do this presentation for you today. Um, I have, as Nikki said, I have quite a lot of ED experience and I really do love the emergency department. I worked for a period of time in a pediatric ED and was the manager of that pediatric ED. And those were some of my favorite um, times. I do think that the relationship that a nurse develops with her patient and the patient's family is so important. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about pediatric neurology um, and my lecture is called Heads Up Pediatric Neuro in the Emergency Department. Um, our objectives today are to identify some specific needs associated with that population, to recognize the different types of seizures and characteristics and what the appropriate interventions are for those seizures, um, describe common causes of stroke in the pediatric population and anticipate those interventions. When we think about stroke, we don't typically think of stroke in the pediatric population, but it does exist. We also wanna recognize the signs and symptoms associated with hydrocephalus and CSF shunt dysfunction, and also identify some misconceptions regarding the assessment and treatment of pain in our pediatric patients. So who are we talking about and what is our focus? Um, when we think about the pediatric patient, pediatrics is defined as the branch of medicine that deals with health and medicine for infants, children, and adolescents from birth up to their 18th birthday. And the word pediatrics means healer of children. Neurologic emergencies are common in this population and neurology deals with the brain, the spine, and the nerves that connect the brain. There are more than 600 diseases of the nervous system and many neurologic dysfunction may result from congenital malformations, tumors, infection, brain injury, and also genetic um, defects in metabolism. When we're dealing with children, we need to consider certain things, such as first, what is the child's baseline? Um, we need to know some normal growth and development because if we don't know the normal, we can't really even hope to understand what's abnormal. We need um, to remember that children are dependent upon adults for their medical care and as well as their medical decisions. And that actually dealing with the parents may be way more difficult and challenging than dealing with the child. Um, you know, I'm a mom and now a grandmom, and our kids are the most important thing to us. And sometimes we don't understand that, or families don't understand that some of the tests that we do are really important to get to the bottom of what's making our child sick. Um, and being able to keep that family informed can be difficult. At the same token, we really need to listen to the parents because believe it or not, they really do know their child better than anyone else. Um, if a parent comes in and says, my kid is just not acting right, you have to listen to that because they know their kid better than anyone else. So we have to start off our, um, our time with a focused history and exam. We need to know the onset of the present illness what kind of behaviors we're seeing from the child, what the symptoms are, if they're on any past medic, um, if they're on any current medications, and if they have a, a past health history that we need to know about. And including in that would be any recent falls or injury. And if they do have a seizure history, because 
you know, kids that have a seizure history, when they come in, the treatment for that seizure might be a whole lot different than if the child um, was a, new, a newly um, diagnosed seizure or this visit is the first time that you're seeing those seizures. Um, and what, what type of seizures do they have if they're recurrent seizures? Is this, um, when was the onset of the first seizure? Or is this the first seizure? How long did it last and what was it like? Because the description is really important to come to an idea as to what kind of seizure this might be. So we need to assess the level of consciousness. Um, we can do it a few different ways. The pediatric Glasgow coma scale is an important one to know, and it's an objective scale. So it's very important to be able to use that objective scale because that's how you know how to compare whether or not there's a change or if something is different. Um, the pediatric assessment scale looks at eye opening. So there's two different scales. One is for under one year and one is for over one year, because obviously kids that are under one year aren't going to, to talk and do all of those other things that our older children can do. So if they're under one year, we look at whether or not they open their eyes spontaneously, if it's to shout, if it's to pain, or if there's no response at all. And if it's over a year, we want to know whether or not it was spontaneous, if it was to verbal command, pain, or no response. The best verbal response is obviously going to depend on their age, um, whether or not they're older, greater than five years, if they're two to five years, or if they're zero to 23 months, the amount of verbal response that you're going to get is different. If a kid is zero to 23 months, then we're looking for whether or not they smile and coo appropriately, or if their cry is inconsolable. Um, whether or not the child is agitated or restless could be an indicator of something going on with them and them not being able to, um, they could have a CNS disturbance that's going on if you're unable to console them. So let's talk about seizures first. So febrile seizures are the most common um, type of seizures that they are that there are. They typically will their typical onset is in the age group of less than five years, and their peak incidence occurs between 18 and 24 months. There are two classifications of febrile seizures, and that's either simple or complex. The simple seizure is one that has no central nervous system infection and no electrolyte imbalance. It's all of a sudden, it has to do with the child change in temperature. It could be because the child was hot and then all of a sudden their temperature came down rather rapidly, or it could be that their normal temperature and all of a sudden they spike a fever and that causes them to have a seizure. It typically lasts less than 10 to 15 minutes. It has no focal onset, and it usually will occur within the 20, first 24 hours of the illness. A complex seizure is a little bit different. It also does not have any central nervous system infection, um, but it's a prolonged generalized seizure activity, typically lasts longer than 15 minutes, and the child may have recurrent seizures with that same illness, or they might not reoccur. So it really can vary. And typically in a complex seizure, you can have more than one in a 24 hour um, interval. The etiology of seizures can be related to infection, trauma, um, an intracranial bleed, could be a toxic exposure, could be metabolic disturbances, anoxia, brain tumors, fever. So it runs the gamut. And parents get really upset when their kid is seizing. And, you know, of course, understandably so. But as you can see, it can be just as simple as the fact that the body is um, having a fever and the way that it, it presents itself is through a seizure. Seizures that are brought on by an acute event, 
are not considered epilepsy. And I think that that's important to remember because you know people hear the word epilepsy and they get really worried. Um, we don't even really use the word epilepsy anymore. We talk about seizure disorders because the word epilepsy is just very, very scary as well. So um, typically if a child is um, having more recurrent seizures, then we do talk about it as a seizure disorder. Epilepsy is actually defined as two or more unprovoked seizures. And that means that there was no, um, which means that there was no acute illness or injury. Many kids will have a seizure and I'll never have another one. Uh, for that reason, seizures can, might not be discovered. Um, they could just go, you know, kind of under, under the radar because a lot of times it could be a very simple kind of a seizure. It could be like an obsans type seizure. And sometimes they go unrecognized. Some of the reasons for seizures um, are due to congenital defects. Uh, it might be idiopathic, it could be trauma, or it could also be related to anoxia and hemorrhage, or sometimes even toxins. So congenital abnormalities may go undiscovered for years. So I have a my primary example of this. My daughter, uh, she's now you know, in her 30s and she's doing just great, but my daughter was diagnosed with a seizure disorder and the first time that she had the episode, she was 14 years old. And, you know, we took her to the doctor. It was a weird episode too. We were just kind of going for a long walk. And as we were walking, she um, just kind of stopped and was staring and rubbing her eyes. And I'm like, what the heck, we're walking. Why are you stopping? And she, after a couple of seconds, I said to her again, I said, you know, what's the matter? Is something wrong? And she's like, no, I just, I get tired sometimes. And I'm like, really? And I thought it was kind of weird. Didn't really do anything about it. Notified the primary care physician. And they're like, don't worry about it. It's not unusual for kids this age to do have these zoning out events. But if it happens again, let us know. So of course I took her back to the doctor because it happened again. And they started to, you know, do a more focused to his history, decided that they would do an MRI and they would do a couple of scans. And when they did, they found out that she actually has poly polymicrogyra, which is a condition where some of the areas of her brain are smooth. And instead of having the usual um, gyri and sulci, she actually has a smooth area of her brain, several smooth areas of her brain. And it's almost as if it's a skip, like a skip in a record. She'll be just kind of going along and all of a sudden there's these obsessive seizures. If they go for a while, then she could end up with more generalized type seizure activity. So when we first found out, their answer was we'll put on medications and Typically with seizures, medications work. You might have to stay on it for two years and your, the child's brain will almost learn a new, a new circuit, whereas they bypass that area of focus that's causing the seizure. Um, and the thought is that after a couple of years with this new circuit that the brain has developed, that that'll become the, the permanent circuit and that will avoid those areas that are causing the areas of focus. Um, in my daughter's case, that didn't actually work. And after several different uh, combinations of medicine, we finally found what works. So, you know, she's been doing just fine. Um, I hate to say that because, you know, I, I don't wanna wish any ill on her, but so, so far so good. Uh, you know, she is unable to drive and there's a lot of sequelae that develop from having a seizure disorder, but for the most part, she's doing uh, really, really well. Status epilepticus is when you have a prolonged seizure that lasts longer than 15 minutes. Um, the seizure won't break on its own. It continues 
And during this time, there's increased tissue oxygen demand due to the muscle contractions. You can have increased cerebral blood flow and increased intracranial pressure. And you can develop brain damage if insufficient oxygen gets to the brain. Um, we wanna make sure that, that the child is safe and that any kind of recurrent seizures with, without recovery in between are not causing any kind of respiratory distress or hy hypoxia. The treatment for uh, um, generalized seizure or for seizures at all varies, and it depends on whether or not it's chronic or if it's acute. If it's acute, we need to figure out what the underlying cause is. And for that, we do CAT scan, we do MRI, we do baseline labs to see if there's an electrolyte imbalance or anything of that nature. Because you know, we all know hypoglycemia, um, hypocalcemia, how hypocalcium and hypomagnesium can all cause seizures. Um, sometimes we need to medicate to stop the seizure so that it doesn't go into uh, a status situation. If the seizures are chronic, then we need to know what medications the child takes and we need to do levels to find out if maybe the levels are just off. Children grow so fast and their weight changes and the way that they metabolize medications can also change. So we wanna develop, get levels if they're chronic and see whether or not we're in a therapeutic dose. Um, if a child comes into the emergency department and they have history of seizures, the, the treatment might be way, way different because a lot of times it can just be figured out by getting those levels and making sure that all of their baseline labs are good as well as the levels of medication that they take. I still always like to get a focused history, find out the past medical history, find out the onset of symptoms, find out whether or not there were any associated symptoms that went along with it, um, how they're eating and drinking is really important as well. And also the parent's impression. Like I said before, if the parent comes in and says, yep, my kid has a seizure disorder, um, but this is totally different. I've never seen this kind of seizure before. Then you need to really look into um, what's going on. The other thing that you need to remember is that this becomes the parent's way of life. So, you know, the little idiosyncrasies that a child has might not be viewed as abnormal behavior by the parents because this is just their new normal. It even comes down to like parents that have children that have um, um, shunt dysfunction or any of those kinds of things. When you're seeing the patient and you're asking them, do they have any kind of medical history? And the parent says, no, no medical history. And then after about five minutes or so, you're talking to the kid and you're finding that, gee, this seems like there's something going on. And then all of a sudden the parent will blurt out, oh, well, they've got this, that, or the other thing. And then that explains it. Um, sometimes there's kids with developmental delays and that becomes the parents normal. So they don't think that there's anything different about their kid. Need to know what kind of changes in the normal eating patterns there are, because that can be an indicator of something more um, acute going on with the child. Another condition that I wanna to speak to you about today is called an apparent life-threatening event. These are events that occur with neonates um, and they can be pretty much anything that looks like they're, it's a life-threatening event. It might be breath holding, it could be some kind of um, gazing off to the side, it could be any one of a number of things, anything that the parents think could be um, a, a problem where they look at their child and they say, I'm really worried, something's wrong with my child, I need to have them evaluated. So these apparent life-threatening events, the child comes into the emergency department with their parents and the child is subjected to a full septic workup. Um, it requires blood testing, it requires lumbar puncture, it requires all kinds of 
invasive testing just to rule out that there's nothing wrong with their child. Um, the reason for this is because for many, many years, it was thought that these apparently threatening events could be a precursor to sudden infant death syndrome. And of course, we wanna make sure nothing ever happens to our children. So that's why this testing occurred. Um, in many cases, this would lead to the child being admitted for 24 to 48 hours and further invasive testing being done. What they found in the research is that these episodes really had nothing to do with um, sudden infant death syndrome. And so our children were being subjected to these invasive procedures uh, for no real reason. So uh, further research was done and we looked at other things that we can do to try to make sure that our children are safe. And um, the next term that I'm gonna to speak to you about is called the brew or brewy. And brew describes an event that occurs in a child under one year of age. It usually lasts for less than one minute, probably about 20 to 30 seconds. And the child has one or more of the following. It could be central cyanosis or pallor. It could be absent or decreased or irregular breathing. Maybe they had a marked change in their tone. It could be hypertonia or hypotonia and some kind of an altered level of responsiveness, which we all know is difficult to show in a neonate. And this episode will resolve and the child would return back to baseline. Uh, the child would then come into the emergency department and the physician would get a history, do a physical exam and get vital signs. If after the um, evaluation is done, we find that there are no um, abnormalities in the physical exam. There's no fever, there's no change in vital signs, there's no sign of respiratory distress or any other abnormalities. Then we coin this a brew. In this case, it does not require the child be hospitalized. It might, if we did find that there was something wrong with either the history or the physical exam or vital signs during the ED evaluation, then this could lead to the child being admitted and further testing done. Might require a sleep study or pneumo, um, pneumogram, could be a CAT scan or an MRI, maybe EEGs, things of that nature, possibly um, a cardiology consultation, echocardiogram, and things like that. But for the most part, this has resulted in a lot of children um, getting less testing. So CSF shunt dysfunction. Uh, how do we know what's going inside, right? So, I mean, there's a part of me that really wishes that we all could be that good doctor that's on the TV show where all of a sudden his eyes kind of go wild and he gets dazed over. This is the autistic uh, physician that plays the part on um, on TV. And all of a sudden you see all this calculations going on in his mind and these pictures, and he's able to come up with the exact thing that's wrong. And I think all of us really wished that we could, we could be like that. But instead, we have to analyze and we have to figure things out with whatever we have at our hand, in our hands. Sometimes it's the family's um, interpretation. Sometimes it's doing lab tests, sometimes it's doing invasive procedures. But what we do need to know is that if a kid does have a, um, a CSF shunt dysfunction, we need to be able to fix it, right? So sometimes kids come in and they have, um, you know, um, blocked cerebral spinal fluid and we need to put in a shunt to help things. And sometimes they come in because they already have a shunt and it's not functioning properly. So again, I wanna begin with a physical assessment. Physical assessment uses all of your senses and it's the essential first step in your physical exam is to just look at the kid, look at the general appearance. Um, there might be respiratory issues that are evident if it is a shunt dysfunction. You might see tachypnea. You might see changes in breathing patterns. You might see apneic episodes, um, especially if there's increased intracranial pressure. 
Some of the cardiovascular symptoms that we'll see is tachycardia in the very young or bradycardia in the adolescent. We wanna obtain baseline blood pressures because we all know it's not just about one isolated blood pressure, it's about where they're going. What's the trend? Is the blood pressure increasing? Are we getting a widening pulse pressure, which could indicate intracranial pressure increasing? We want to assess the skin um, and see if there's fever present, because sometimes we can get that with a, fun, a shunt infection. We want to assess the level of consciousness, and we can either use the Glasgow Coma Score or we can use AVPU. So AVPU is a nice, easy neurological assessment where we can see if the child is awake and alert. Um, are they responding only to verbal stimuli? Are they responding only to painful stimuli? Or are they unresponsive? Um, when you have CSF dysfunction, you can also see sometimes the child has an inability to track and maybe some blurred vision. And so that's also an indicator. You might see some dizziness, um, vomiting. But the other thing is that so many of these symptoms um, are, can pertain to any of the injuries, that illnesses that we're talking about. So I think that that's where really using your physical assessment skills um, are important. When we inspect the head, we may find that we have an increased head circumference. We might see that we have a bulging fontanelle. We could see widening sutures, a dilated scalp veins, and even downturned eyes, which we call sunset eyes. So sunset eyes are pretty classic. Um, and you can see here in this picture that Basically, it occurs in hydrocephalus in infants and children, and the inferior border of the pupil is often covered by the lower eyelid, and it gives that sunset appearance. Once you see them, you kind of never, you know, never forget them. Obviously, this child has um, a very large head and hydrocephalus, but sometimes it's their heads are not as large as this, and so. Um, it's the eyes that then give it away. Sorry, my, my slides, my clicker's not working, so I'm scrolling with the mouse and sometimes it goes the wrong way, I apologize. So strokes, you know, strokes can happen at any age and pediatric stroke is more serious than it was first thought. And believe it or not, it rank, ranks among the top 10 causes of death in children. It's classified by the age of the child and it can be his ischemic or hemorrhagic the same way that it can be in an adult. Um, it's classified by the age of the child and it can be, like I said, ischemic or hemorrhagic. So perineal stroke, perinatal strokes occur between 28 weeks gestation and 28 days after birth. Neonatal are for your first month of life, just like your neonate and pediatric are from day 30 through 18 years. Um, the reason why they classify this is because it also helps researchers to study how and why strokes occur at different ages. Some common illnesses mimic stroke, and that includes migraine, encephalitis, um, tumors, and sometimes even like a postictal state. Sometimes a child will come into the emergency department and they appear postictal, but you don't really know what preceded the event that you're seeing right now. And it could have been a stroke. Um, so you need to try to figure out what it is. And what I like about being an ED nurse is the fact that we are all CSI guys. Um, people come into the ED, we try to figure out what it is. And basically we have to use all of our resources that we know, all of our experiences, and that helps us to figure out what, what could be going wrong with that child. So there's a couple of different stroke scales that we can use. There's the PEED NIHS S score, um, and this helps us. It's a slight adaptation of the NIHS S score. Um, a FAST scale is also used the same as it is with an adult, where we evaluate the face, the arms, the speech, and 
um, test in time of onset. And then there's the Roger scale. And the Roger stands for recognition of stroke in the emergency room. And this implements a seven item scale where we use the FAST combined with patient demographics, blood pressure, blood glucose levels, seizure activity, and loss of consciousness. And we look at all of those different things to try to come up with a score. So there's an algorithm here um, that you might have difficulty seeing, but basically the pa pediatric patient presents to the emergency department. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna obtain that history, past medical history, um, and then we're going to look at whether or not there's any differences in, in the child with their FAST and our ability to recognize um, stroke-like symptoms. And if we are seeing it, then we're gonna go down one pathway. If we're finding that the, um, there's a negative FAST or negative Roger score, then we're gonna consider that it could be a diagnosis of um, something else, an alternative stroke. The stroke might still be a possibility, but it could be that there's something else going on. And we anticipate certain things. We wanna anticipate going for that STAT non-contrast non CT, the same as we would for adults. And the difficulty here is that, you know, you're not really expecting that this child is having a stroke. So of course, when the adult comes in and they have a new onset of confusion, you know, we get the glucose for that, that adult and right away we think stroke. But in the child, we don't always anticipate that it could be a stroke. So what we do is a little bit different. Um, I think in the emergency nurses uh, journal, there was this pathway that was used, this pa pathway algorithm, and it was published, oh, I can't remember which year it was, 2013. And basically, it was at that time that they instituted this algorithm. So for those of us that don't necessarily have a huge child population, just being aware of the fact that it could be a stroke is something that I think that you know you should consider. Um, I do have permission from Cincinnati Children's Hospital to use this video, which talks about surviving a pediatric stroke. So I'm going to attempt to pull up the video again in these days of uh, virtual um, Zoom, sometimes videos can be a little trying, so I'm going to attempt to do it here. Wish me luck. All right. Um, Hopefully you're seeing my screen. She's really fancied herself sitting up there in the head's office, said Hermione viciously as they walked. At age 10, Claudia Veach loves to read Harry Potter books. I really like how they all break the rules all the time. It's really funny just to see them all get in trouble. But two years ago, her love of books came to an abrupt end when she suddenly had a stroke. Her mom was at work when it happened, but got home in time to meet the ambulance. I asked the EMT, like, what is happening to her? And he said, I believe she's having a stroke. And I said, she's eight. And he said, as long as you have blood pumping through your veins, you can have a stroke. At Cincinnati Children's, doctors responded quickly, running a series of tests that confirmed Claudia's stroke. Time is really incredibly critical. The sooner that we can act, so either open up the blood vessel or better support the brain's recovery after that stroke. And it's really quite important. This is Claudia's age right here. So on the left, we actually see a picture of uh, her stroke, that brain area right there. Pediatric strokes are rare, happening in about 1 in 25,000 children. Claudia's type of stroke is called a focal cerebral arteriopathy, which causes blood vessel inflammation that leads to narrowing and a major artery in one part of the brain. Doctors are hoping more research will yield answers as to why this happens. The child that shows up with the stroke, they had the same kind of upper respiratory bug or what have you that you and I are going to get a cold from. 
but for whatever reason, in this particular age group, they their bodies mount an immune response that causes antibodies that cause inflammation in that blood vessel. Well, at Cincinnati Children's, Claudia's care team treated her with medications, including high-dose steroids that targeted the inflammation. She responded well and went home. Outpatient therapies followed. What wasn't expected was the once avid reader didn't want to read anymore. If I opened the book, I would just get like a headache. They were able to determine that there was a portion of reading comprehension that was basically damaged in the part of her brain that the stroke occurred. To fix the problem, Claudia took part in more therapy. In addition, her mom started reading to her just like she did when she was younger. This helped Claudia find her love of reading again. There was one night that she said, Mom, can I read to you? I said, absolutely. So I gave her the book and she read to me. And... That was it. At her two-year checkup, Claudia did well and is on her way back to a normal life. Can I, like, go on to After we ask for the sun, yes. It's going to happen at any age. Um, that's the number one piece. Still, when we tell people about it, the reaction is always, what? She had a what? They always think that we meant to say seizure, but we didn't it's a stroke, and that that can happen at any age. So knowing that is huge, and if there's even one person that gets that message and their child is, is saved from that information, then we've done our job. And I think that that video is very telling. I think that it's important that um, we can recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke, the same as those signs and symptoms in stroke in an adult, so that we can be prepared and not just automatically assume that it's not a stroke. Um, same thing is true for children as it is for adults. The sooner that we act on it, the better, and the long-term um, outcome is definitely affected by early intervention. So the last piece that I wanna to talk to you about is traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injuries um, or pediatric concussion are things that we also need to pay attention to in the emergency department. When parents come in with their child and their child has fallen, we need to pay attention to what kind of symptoms that they're having. One of the important parts of traumatic brain injury isn't so much that initial injury, but second impact syndrome. So many institutions um, across the nation now actually have tests that they put into effect, which measure how your reactive time, your reaction time. Um, the kids will do these different different tests and that will develop what their baseline is. Then should they be involved in any kind of a sports activity injury, they would have to go back to do that test again to see what their, what their cognition is and what their reaction time is. If their reaction time is still impaired, then they're not allowed to go back to sports. Um, the Academy of Neurology revised position statement on concussion in sports indicates that these, these children should not go back to playing sports until they're cleared and until they're back to within less than 20% of what their initial screen was. So making sure that our kids are safe, safe is extremely important. We're still going to make sure we get an, a focused assessment when these kids come into the emergency department. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're not missing anything. There's different kinds of um, traumatic brain injuries. You could have a, a bleed, a subdural bleed. You can have an epidural bleed. We're not gonna go into all those different types of bleeds. What I mostly wanna make sure that people are aware of is the fact that if the child had a fall and there was a concussion, that they're not going back to sports quickly. Um, the Academy of Neurology has also found that the inability to concentrate after a traumatic brain injury is a very real thing. Um, not putting these kids back to full school, sometimes they have accommodations that are made for them so that they have less homework that they have to do are all very important. 
where second impact syndrome co comes along is it's after you've had a first insult to the brain and then you are subjected to a second insult. The brain hasn't fully recovered from the first insult. And that's why you'll have um, you know, football players previously that were allowed to return into the game after sub after suffering from a concussion and then all of a sudden getting a second hit and then not getting um, not living through that second hit, not being able to get up off the ground. So there are a lot of things that we have put in place to try to protect our children. And, you know, parents can be the worst. I mean, I had a dad one time who his son was, you know, the star of the football team. And he had a head injury and we were keeping him out of sports. And the dad was like, well, no, 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 he's got to go back, you know, the playoffs or whatever, or, you know, there's a recruiter that's coming and we've got to be able to get him back on the field. We need to be advocates for our kids and not let them, uh, let families put them back into sports too soon. And we need to be able to make sure that they can recover. So being able to really appreciate life, I think is what it's all about. Remembering that families, um, you know, our kids are the most important thing to every single one of us. And when something's going wrong with your kid, you just can't help but be worried and concerned and reassuring those parents and providing the best care that you possibly can. Um, sometimes parents are really difficult to deal with. They're more difficult to deal with than the child themselves but really trying to empathize and remembering just how worried they are and um, providing the best care that you can, I think is what it's all about. So thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'm sorry that it's virtual. I'm hoping that someday in the future, our presentations can be live. But again, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation.